السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه ومن استنى بسنته إلى يوم الدين اللهم اجعلنا منهم ومن الذين أنعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر أمي رب العالمين ثم أما بعد فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم فبما رحمة من الله لنت لهم ولو كنت فضا غليظ القلب لنفض من حولك فاعف عنهم واستغفر لهم وشابرهم في الأمر فإذا عزمت فتوكل على الله إن الله يحب المتوكلين رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي واللهم ثبتنا عند الموت بلا إله إلا الله أم يا رب العالمين إن شاء الله تعالى This uh, lecture is actually based on a discussion I had with one of the TDC volunteers uh, who was asking me about my experience my very brief experience of having traveled to a great number of Muslim communities across the United States about 75 of them all over the country and having spent at least a couple of weeks in each of them um, I began to notice some things that are uh, across the board almost universal problems. Problems that all of you perhaps are familiar with and um, that, that you face. And of course problems that as I traveled in, in all of these communities as a guest, people sort of open up to guests and they tell them stuff that they're really not supposed to know, but they tell them anyway. And people open up the whole can of worms, let me tell you what's going on in my community, you know, that sort of thing. And so, um, so I, you know, I heard a lot of this and it, it came to a point after I heard it about two dozen, three dozen times, that the next time I heard it I said, wait, you're about to tell me, let me tell you. And, and they said, how'd you know? Who told you? I said, crazy guess. But basically what I came to discover was that the Muslim community, subhanAllah, we have a lot of great assets. And we, we have not that many problems. You think we have many problems. We have very few large problems. But we have pretty much the same problems across the board. Now I'm going to just throw some questions at you, perhaps at your local masjid. And, and, and this talk really, it's designed not just for people that are volunteers or helping out at a masjid, even though it is for them too. People that are working in any capacity in a collective form. You know, you can serve Islam individually when you make salah. You know, it's your individual contribution to your deen for yourself, right? But then there's a collective contribution where you come together with other Muslims and you try to do something. This could be at your MSA, this could be at a Sunday school, this could be at an Islamic school, this could be at a da'wah organization, this could be at an educational institute, this could be at a masjid, it could be at any, or putting a conference together, right? Muslims come together to serve the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? Now the thing is, people come together to, you know, when they come together, they come for a higher purpose that they couldn't have established or, or, or accomplished themselves. Of course, we do this at work, right? We come together and we do something. We work on projects together. You'll find that uh, you'll find people that are very easy to get along with at work. Really friendly guy, like he's, you know, everybody loves him. <coughs> that same guy is a volunteer at the masjid. And man, is he mean. This guy's really hard. You probably avoid saying salamu alaikum to him because if he catches, you'll just be really mean, right? So you find this, this almost contradiction between two personalities. Why is this person so nice everywhere else? When it comes to Islam, when it comes to working with other Muslims, it's very harsh. So we're going to try and tackle some of these issues because they are at the heart of the communication catastrophe, the problem we have in our masajid. We're not able to communicate with each other for a higher purpose. We're not able to communicate with each other at an MSA or the youth group or the qabila even for a, you know, whatever, you know, chapter. Something like that, it's, you're not able to do so sometimes only because of these subtle issues, these subtle vibes that are taking place that, are, that exist. Anyway, let's look at the masjid for example. Common questions that are a point of conflict. Who should be the imam? How should the masjid funds be spent? Should it be on the dome or the parking lot or the playground or what else? When do we celebrate Eid al-Ramadan? When does it begin? Does it begin Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday or Friday? What organizations to endorse or not to endorse? How do you elect a board member? What is the role of the imam versus the emir of the masjid? You know, then the board members are always saying all people do is complain. And the people are saying all these board members do is they don't even listen to us. So th this is going on on both sides, right? And volunteers also, the same thing. People working at an MSA, like all these guys, all they do is complain, but they never distribute any flyers, they never help out with anything. So there's this complaint, there's this ill feeling on both sides. You know, who should have the right to, to uh, complain and how should they do so? You know, 
uh, how do we deal with suggestions? What are the you know, rights and powers and responsibilities that come with a position? You're the secretary of, or the treasurer of the MSA, or you're the vice president of the masjid, or you're the vice principal of the school, or the principal of the school, something like that. You know, what, what does that mean? What is your role? What is your responsibility? What, do, what powers do you execute? And when do you get to have a say? You know, there's this, this thing, and uh, almost all the massages that I went to, there's this thing about you becoming a board member, but you don't really have a say until a year. And after a year, then you'll have a say because we don't want the musallah people to take over the board. And you know what that means? That means there's people that come to pray regularly, but they're not on the board. And then there's the people who come to visit every Friday, but they're on the executive committee. And they don't want the people who regularly pray to be on the committee. And there's a struggle between the people who actually attend the masjid and the people in charge of the masjid. And both sides have this ill feeling towards it. And some of you are going, yeah, man, that's me. <laughs> or or I, don't, I don't know what side of the aisle you're on, it doesn't matter. The problem is we have these conflicts. We have this drama taking place all over. Over and over again, the same thing. And over and over, over again, there are very simple lessons that if we just took consideration of them, these lessons would be very, it would be, it would be, these problems would be solved. The first problem that I'd like to share with you is our view of the Qur'an and Sunnah. Our view of the Qur'an and Sunnah is that these are religious texts with spiritual benefit. Or maybe some family advice, some family counsel, at the most. We don't really see the Qur'an and the Sunnah as sources of solutions for administrative problems. We don't see them as sources of solutions for executive problems, for organizational dysfunction, for communication problems. We don't look for solutions in the Qur'an and Sunnah for these things. We look at the Qur'an and Sunnah as spiritual texts sometimes. And we don't look at them as really guidance for any problem, for any problem. And so you, as a manifestation of that, you find in the masajid, you find sometimes there's the religious committee and there's the executive committee. And the, if you try to quote an ayah or a hadith in the administrative executive committee, you know what they say? Uh, no, that's the religious committee. Here's where we talk about administrative matters. As if to say, the Qur'an and Sunnah really don't have any counsel to offer, any advice to offer, any solutions to offer for organizational problems. Well, it does. And the first thing I'd like you to understand is, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he is the role model for us in everything, right? We all know this. And you've heard this many times before. He plays many roles. Does he play the role of a father? Yes, which means every one of us that's a father should look at the Messenger of Allah وسلم, and understand what kind of father he was. Was he a husband? Yes. So every one of us who's a husband should look at his example and figure out what kind of husband he was. Was he a teacher? Yes. So a teacher looks, for example, in the Messenger of Allah وسلم, You understand? Now at the same time, was the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam, in addition to being Rasul, which we will never be. That's one role only he has, we will never have. But in addition to that, was he a leader? Yeah. Was he an organizer? Yeah. He organized people. He had people under him. Were there some people under him that had problems? That created problems? Yeah. People who claim to be under his command also created problems. So what we find is as a leader, the, the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he is a messenger. But at the same time, he left us a sunnah as a father, as a husband, as a friend, as a teacher, also as an organizational leader, as a manager, as, a, as one who manages people. And there are people, in, when you manage people at work or at a masjid or anywhere else, there are people that you get along with, that people that are easy to deal with, there are people that are fun to be around, and then there are those people you say, man, I gotta meet with that guy again. Or those pe you know, people you don't wanna deal with, but they're a part of the organization too. And these problem individuals, these problem people, were also a part of the jama'ah of the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The Qur'an terms them the munafiqoon. I'm not saying you label your troubled people munafiqoon. That's not what I'm saying, please understand. That label is something Allah gives. Even the messenger did not expose them. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So if you want to take from the sunnah, don't say when you say hypocrite, I can think of three people right now that fit that description. You shouldn't be thinking like that. You're not allowed, we're not allowed to think like that. In this religion, we are not allowed to judge people. We are only allowed to judge behavior. We can say this action was wrong. Allah's speech was wrong. 
that thing you said wasn't appropriate, that, th that thing you did wasn't appropriate, but that person is still not considered a hypocrite. That you cannot judge. Because hypocrisy lies where? In the heart, and only Allah judges the heart. So to you and me, that's still a Muslim. You understand? So this is one of our first problems. Our first, one of our first problems is, we are very quick to label people when they don't go along with our definitions of what is a good believer, a good worker, a good whatever. This is a troublemaker, this guy is no good, this guy's word and action are apart, etc, etc. This is, by the way, actually Allah Azza wa Jal forbade us from doing this in, in keeping cohesion in the community. And by the way, as a homework assignment for this talk, study carefully the contents of Surah Al-Hujurat, Surah number 49. Surah Al-Hujurat is the surah that deals with cohesion and unity and structure and deals with all the problems that occur in your community. If you study that surah carefully, you will find all the problems you have in your community came from one of the things that were violated in Surah Al-Hujurat. You know, Allah Azza wa Jalla tells us, إِنَّ بَعْدَ الظَّنِّ إِثْمِ Right? Don't make assumptions about people. Because what will, re what will happen after you make assumptions is sin. What this means is people are working for the sake of Islam. By the way, I should have mentioned this before. Most people that work in Islamic organizations in any capacity, are they employees or volunteers? They're volunteers. They're volunteers, which means they don't have to be there. Which means they came in, you have to assume with good intention, they came in giving their time, their effort, for something they're not getting paid for, for the sake of Allah. This is the ideal candidate for shaitan. This man or woman, who decided to give their time, despite their other priorities in life. They could have been making money with that time, they could have been entertaining themselves with that time. But they're attending this three hour boring meeting with that time. They're going out delivering flyers with that time. They're doing that with their time. This is the ideal candidate for shaitan. This is the guy shaitan wants to have go back home and sit on the laptop and just browse YouTube. That's what he wants. So Allah Azza wa Jal warns us, وَقُلْ لِعِبَادِي يَقُولُ الَّتِي هِيَ أَحْسَنِ Say to my slaves, utter that which is the best. Say the best possible thing. Say the most beautiful things. إِنَّ الشَّيْطَانَ يَنْزَغُ بَيْنَكُمْ No doubt it is shaitan who will cause dissent among you. No doubt it is shaitan who will cause dissent among you. The ayah begins by saying, you should say the best thing. The ayah ends by saying, shaitan will cause dissent. Meaning, you and I, when we work for an Islamic cause, there are other people that are working. Some volunteers are harder working, and other volunteers are not as hard working. When people aren't working as hard as you are, you know what happens? You say, man, that guy doesn't show up to the meeting on time. Didn't do this, didn't do that. <coughs> so you have harsh words. Once you have harsh words, this guy says, forget you, man, I'm coming here as a volunteer. Who are you to tell me? We're all volunteers, we're all equal here. And this starts. But actually, who, who is laughing at all of this? Shaitan is laughing at all of this. You fell right into the trap. You, fell, you walked right into it. So Allah commands His slaves to say that which is the best. And you will find, when you work for the cause of Islam, you will find that you will be unusually frustrated. Unusually frustrated. Especially with Muslims. And especially with Muslims who are working, volunteering. Not the guy who doesn't pray or ever barely shows up to the masjid or barely hangs out at the MSA, the guy who's working hard at the MSA like you are, you'll be really frustrated with them. Why? Because shaitan wants this. He wants this cohesion to break. So here, the first thing, I, I, I want to talk about a lot of stuff, and I'm jumping around, but still. One of the things I want to talk about is the position, the responsibility of a leader. Of course, this is a voluntary organization. But in every organization, you need leadership. You can't have two cooks. You can't have multiple leaders. There has to be some kind of a ranking system. Some kind of a ranking system. Unfortunately, the problem occurs when, you know, one of the, one of the salient features of Islam is a leader, the qualified leader is the one who doesn't want leadership. Right? This is one of the great qualities of Islam. The qualified leader is the one who doesn't want leadership. Leadership is thrust upon them against their will. What we find most of the time, are people who are saying, man, these guys don't know what they're doing, I need to be in charge. I don't know why they're not voting for me. I don't understand. They know I, have, you know, I do this, 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 and this. I'm getting all these things done. They don't see that I'm qualified. I need to be in charge. So there's this, first of all, shaitan convinces you 
that you need to be running things because unless you run things, it's all gonna go into a rut. You're the one. You're the one. Everybody else is a loser. This is an ego inflation for the sake of Islam. See the irony in this whole thing? You're aggrandizing yourself, but you're saying to yourself, I'm doing this not for me, but for what? For Islam. What a game shaitan plays. By the way, just as a reality check, you and I, we think we do things for Islam. Allah's deen does not need us. Allah's deen does not need you and me. You and I think, man, I'm going to this job, I'm providing for my family, I'm, if I don't go, what's gonna happen? Allah will take your life like that in the middle of traffic. It'll be gone. Yet He will still provide for your wife and child. Because you are not their raziq, who's their raziq? Allah Azza wa Jal. You and I think, if I don't do this thing, who's gonna do it? Who? There's no, nobody else around to pick up my slack. Don't think like that. Allah has given you a gift to let you serve Him. You are not the super highly qualified, ranking, you know, unique personality without which this whole thing will collapse. No, 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 that's not how we think. We are blessed to be able to serve Allah Azza wa Jal. You see, when Ibrahim alayhi salam is building Allah's house, who's there besides him? That's right. Two people? If they don't build it, who will build it? Nobody? But they are building Allah's house, begging to Allah, oh Allah, accept from us. They're not looking around, we better build it fast because you know this needs to be good construction because who else is gonna do it? No, no, no. They're humble before Allah. They're nervous that Allah won't accept this work from them. So first our attitude has to change. We are not there to make things better, we are there to serve Allah. We're not there to make things better. Who makes things better? Allah, that's in Allah's hands. Change is not in our hands. Change is in Allah's hands. The only thing we can do is make the effort. Giving that effort success or failure is in the hands of Allah Azza wa Jal. And this is the biggest attitude change we need in our masajid. We think we're the agents of change. We think our leadership is the agent of the lack of change. No, the lack of change or change, this doesn't come from you and me, it comes from the Lord. It comes from Allah Azza wa Jal. This is the first change of attitude. Now about leaders. If you do have a leader, what are the qualities of a leader? The only quality I want to share with you, though they have many qualities, the only two qualities I want to share with you, one, first of all, in the Arabic language, the leader, the term for the leader, you know? Amir. Amir. And there are two words in Arabic, Amir and Amir. Amir is ism fa'il, Amir is ism sifa mushabbaha, I'm not giving you an Arabic lesson, I promise. Amir means, so there are two words in Arabic, Amir and Amir. You may have heard these names for some Muslim boys too, right? Amir and Amir. Amir means the one who commands. Amir means the one who commands authority. I'll say that again. Amir is the one who commands. Amir is the one who commands authority. Meaning an Amir doesn't have to command you to be an Amir. He, in and, his, in and of his own personality, in and of his own rank, he already commands authority. He doesn't have to tell you what to do, he's there already. Now, a good Amir, like a good, if a father is a good Amir, he doesn't have to tell his kids to pray. They just pray. Why? Because they know that's something that the father expects. A good Amir, a, a good manager at work, does not have to come to tell you to come in on time. A good manager is such that his workers come in on time anyway. If he has to tell them over and over again, he is no longer Amir. What is he? Amir. Political Science 101. The more police you need, the less control you have over your people. The more you have to command is an indication of what? The less control you have. The less you have to tell people what to do, that is an indication that the people accept your authority and they're listening to you. This is an emir. So one has to become an emir. Now, this people lovingly accepting what you have to say, respecting you, listening to you, complying with your instructions, you have to say very little, if anything. Is this something that just happens? No, people don't just give that to anybody. This is some characteristics that are earned. So a leader has to acquire certain, certain characteristics. That's when they become a leader. You may be blessed in your community with a person that everybody loves. Maybe. Speech was wrong. Maybe. 
There are some people Allah gifts them with certain personality traits and everybody gravitates towards them naturally. These are natural leaders. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was a natural leader. But even he was given leadership advice. And this is the advice I want to share with you. Allah gave him leadership advice. At the battle of Uhud, was there a disappointment? Yes. Some Sahaba have disappointed the Messenger. Some Sahaba, he's the leader. And his followers, some of them have disappointed him. Some of them have not. Some of them have. When the leader is disappointed, what is he supposed to do? If it's a frustrating situation, your boss, your leader, the Amir of the Masjid, he called a meeting, it was at 8 o'clock, you showed up at 8.30, he says, why are you late? Right? Why are you late? So the messenger has a right to be upset. This is a big deal. This is not a meeting, this is a battlefield. This is a big deal. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals in the context of Uhud, this ayah. He says, فَبِمَا رَحْبَةٍ مِّنَ اللَّهِ لِنْتَ لَهُمْ It is by Allah's mercy alone that you are lenient towards them. The first thing he tells this leader, sallallahu alayhi wa is be what with your followers? Lenient. Now, there's a need to be lenient not with the good followers, because you're already nice to them. Who do you have to be lenient with? The bad followers, the ones who disappointed you. You have to be lenient towards them. Then Allah adds something profound, something mind-boggling. He says, وَلَوْ كُنْتَ فَضَّنْ غَلِيدَ الْقَلْبِ Had you been hard, harsh in the heart, you had, had you been tough with them, لَنْ فَضُّوا مِنْ حَوْلِكَ They would have run away from you. Think about this. They would have run away from you. لَنْ فَضُّوا مِنْ حَوْلِكَ Who would have run away from him? Who? The Sahaba? Allah didn't say, if you stopped calling to the truth. He's still calling to the truth. He's still the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He still has the miraculous Qur'an being revealed to him. Only one thing has changed. He's not nice. And as a consequence, the, biggest, the greatest of the believers, the best of the generations, what does Allah say about them? What would have happened? They would have run away. If only one thing changed, if you weren't nice, if you were hard, hard to deal with, if you were harsh, Imagine this standard being set for the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam as a leader. That is the Sunnah of the Messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam as a leader. What we learn from that is the disappointment that he faced in battle from some of his companions is much less than the disappointment you will face when somebody forgets to send out the emails, or when somebody forgets to place the order, or when somebody forgets to make the calls, or when somebody forgets to show up at the meeting. It is much less. So what should you do? Be lenient, be nice, be grateful to Allah that this person who could have been doing so many other things at least trying, they're at least trying to do this. Allah didn't even stop there. Allah gave him more advice. The Messenger of Allah Wasallam. So first he says to him, then فَضُّوا مِنْ حَوْلِكَ They would have run away from you. فَعْفُوا عَنْهُمْ Then lovingly forgive them. There are two kinds of forgiveness. There's a bad kind of forgiveness and there's a good kind of forgiveness. You know if you disappointed me, and you're sitting here and in front of everybody I say, by the way brother, I forgive you. <laughs> and that thing you did, that was pretty disgusting, but you know, I still forgive you. What I've just done is I've humiliated you. I haven't actually forgiven you, I've exposed you. A lot of times in the Muslim community, I travel around and I, you know, brother I want to talk to you about something, what do you want to talk about? You know this brother, may Allah forgive him, he does this. Wait, wait, wait. Why are you telling me, may Allah forgive him? You're not really telling me so Allah may forgive him. You're telling me because he does sins and you want me to know. You're not really telling me, Allah, may Allah forgive him. You're re you're, what you're actually doing is you're exposing your brother. If you really want Allah to forgive him, ask Allah to forgive him in, per in private. Right? In private. Not in public, in private. That's the key. Anyway, Allah says, lovingly forgive them. Lovingly pardon them. So now, you sometimes lovingly pardoning someone means you don't even tell them you forgive them. Because for a volunteer, if you forgive them, you go to them and say, I forgive you by the way. They might say, forgive me for what? They might not, they might not even see that they did something wrong. As a courtesy to them, you don't even tell them. You just, in your heart, you forgive them. In your heart, you just drop it. You let it go. You let it go. You don't hold that grudge. Then Allah Azza wa says, وَاسْتَغْفِرْ لَهُمْ Ask Allah to forgive them. 
First you forgive them, and then when you make dua for yourself, Ya Allah, give me Jannah, forgive my sins, make me regular in my prayers, protect my children, allow me to go to Hajj this year, by the way, forgive that brother. Forgive that brother. That brother that offended you, that brother that disappointed you, that sister that did that to you, that said that to you, ask dua for her. Subhanallah. What a standard for a leader. And then on top of everything else, you see what happens is, when there's an organizational conflict, between the leader and a follower, any follower, then of course, after the event, even if you forgive them, it's not the same as it used to be before the incident. So the leader, the manager, the emir, the president, whoever, they may not ask suggestions of the follower like they used to. It's not like the, before. So the follower feels like, man, this, he used to take my opinion. He used to ask me to do things. It's not like it was. Ever since I've made that mistake, things have changed. So there's this bad feeling inside whose heart? The follower's heart. Even though he's been forgiven, there's still a bad feeling. Allah doesn't even want that feeling. He commands his messenger, now listen to this. He commands his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, وَشَاوِرْهُمْ فِي الْأَمْرِ Take their counsel, take their opinion when you make a decision. We're talking about the messenger of Allah. He's a leader, but first he's the messenger of Allah. When he makes a decision, is it based on whims? What is it based on? Wahi, revelation. When he makes a decision, he doesn't need anybody's opinion. But to make that follower's heart cleansed, to make him close again, to build, to keep that cohesion, Allah Azza wa Jal commands His Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, وَشَاوِرْهُمْ فِي الْأَمْرِ Take their opinion, take their counsel when you make a decision. And it is clear that in fact the decision lies in whose hands? The messenger. He's the actual authority. So Allah adds, clarifies, فَإِذَا عَزَمْتَ فَتَوَكَّلْ عَلَى اللَّهِ He didn't say فَإِذَا عَزَمْتُمْ He says فَإِذَا, عزم, فإذا عَزَمْتَ When you have made a decision, when you have reached resolve, then put your trust in Allah. When you've reached a decision. But still, make the followers feel included. Genuinely included because it's a command of Allah. How many of our leaders take opinions? How many of our leaders, when they are given an opinion, they get annoyed? Yes, thank you brother. Anyway, what was the other item? And you just move on. This is, not the, this is not the opinion section. Or this matter has already been decided. Or whatever, whatever. We're, we hate people's suggestions. We hate them. We feel as though they are a footprint on our ego. This guy is trying to put me down by giving me a suggestion. If you understand that you are not there for yourself, you are there for who? For, you're a slave of Allah. And that guy is also a slave of Allah. And you two slaves are working to serve Allah, then you will not feel offended by opinions. But if you feel you are the leader, you've made a decision, this is your project, and then somebody gives you an opinion, how dare they? They're stepping on your territory. So there's, this is an issue really of the mindset. What happens is we come into Islamic projects with sincere intentions, but over time we start owning them. My masjid, my board, my committee, my this, my that. I, the ego comes in. Serving Allah disappears, it starts fading away into the background, and I come into the picture. I need to have the mic right after the khutbah is done. Why did he make the announcements? He shouldn't have done that. He wasn't authorized by me. That's what happens. So these are some characteristics of leaders. Then a little bit about I, what I wanted to share with you about was about meetings. In any organization, one of the most important gathering is the meeting. MSAs have meetings. Volunteer da'wah organizations have meetings. Masajid have meetings. And you know what? Most of our problems exist because we don't know how to hold a meeting. We don't know how to hold a meeting. Allah Azza wa gives us such beautiful advice about meetings. Now listen to this. Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu, O those of you who believe, إِذَا قِيلَ لَكُمْ تَفَسَّحُوا فِي الْمَجَالِسِ فَفْسَحُوا يَفْسَحِ اللَّهُ لَكُمْ Those of you who believe, when it is said to you, spread out in the meeting. Spread out. Spaces between each other. Then spread out. May Allah spread between you, meaning spread love and mercy between you. Unity between you. So you don't sit in the meeting smack next to each other, you sit apart. You, you know the strategy, the reason? 
the person speaking at the meeting. Two people that are friends walk into the meeting, late. Do they sit together or apart? They sit together. But if everybody is spread out, where do they have to sit? Apart. When they sit apart, can they talk to each other? No. But when they sit together, five people walk into a meeting late. And by the way, the latecomers are usually the troublemakers too. So they come in late, and they sit, their little clique sits in the corner somewhere by themselves. And the leader is talking and they're going, <laughs> or they're, you know, playing, they're making paper balls and throwing them at each other. Or they're, they're talking among each other, or they're smirking at the comments of other people, or they're whispering to each other, making the leader look incompetent, undermining the whole process. A great strategy spread out. So when the latecomer comes in, he's sitting between two serious people like a prisoner. <laughs> Right? But then even more important, even more important, وَإِذَا قِيلَ لَكُمُ انشزو. When it is said to you, leave. Leave, disperse. Unshuzu. Get out, go away. When it is said to you, go away, go away. Why? There's a meeting. Let's, I'll make a hypothetical meeting, okay? There's a meeting, we're gonna build a basketball court in the masjid, or at the masjid. There's a meeting going on, and you have an opinion about this thing. You don't think basketball courts should exist because they are haram or something. But you don't say anything in the meeting. So you listen to the whole meeting, they take a vote, and they approve it. Any objections? No objections. The meeting is done. You go to your best friend. Man, these people don't even know it's haram. I keep telling them. Did you say anything at the meeting? No. You went to your friend who likes, likes to listen to you, you get in the car as you're leaving the meeting, and you say, man, I keep telling them they don't listen. He goes, yeah, man, they don't listen. And now you're having a meeting after the meeting. Right? This is your meeting after the meeting. And what this does, now what happens is, let's call this other guy and tell him basketball courts are haram too. By the way, they're not. Brother Nawaz said Okay, but... <laughs> so anyway, they, go, they call this third guy, and now they have their, their sub-meeting. Before next meeting, we should come to a conclusion that this decision was wrong. So now they come pre-prepared, a group from among the larger meeting group, with an agenda that they've already set on the side when they met by themselves. By the way, this is called najwa. This is called najwa. And this is a satanic thing. Why? This destroys the unity of a community. People realize that these guys are always on the same team. Our people are smart, they're not dumb. When you come to enough meetings, and you guys are always ganged up together, people figure it out. So you know what other people do? Oh yeah? You want to make your team? We'll have our meeting after the meeting. We'll make our team. And eventually one board, one group, one executive committee turns into two. Happens all the time. Happens all the time. Why does it happen? Because what is discussed in the meeting is not taken as an amana. These majalis, these meetings, they are a trust. So your friend calls you and says, let's talk about that thing we talked about at the meeting. You say, no, no. We will talk about it at the next meeting in front of everyone. If you want to talk about it, talk to the emir directly. Don't talk to anybody else. Or talk to everybody at the same time. But do not talk to each other about it. Because now you are being unfair to the community. You are the fitna. You think everybody else is the fitna? If you do this, you're the fitna. You're the problem. You're the problem. This is one big problem in our communities. We have secret gatherings. We have board, executive committees within executive committees that are trying to outdo the other. Then on top of this we have dhan. What this means is, instead of appreciating the fact that we're coming together for the sake of Allah, whatever our ignorance, our mistakes, our shortcomings, our misunderstandings, even of Islam maybe, we are waiting, we are waiting for our fellow volunteer to make a mistake. We're waiting for it. And as soon as they do, you know what we're gonna do? Aha! I knew you weren't qualified. You see what you did? Email the world about it. Put it on the masjid homepage. Maybe even pass out a flyer after Jummah. Because this person made a mistake. You see what this person did? Let me tell you. May Allah forgive him. Let me tell you. <laughs> so we have, what I'm trying to say then is, we have no mercy towards each other. We are very cutthroat. All for volunteering for the sake of Allah. Does this make any sense? To be cutthroat, to be this merciless, serving Allah's religion, 
Is this what the religion does? Allah Azza wa Jal describes the believers Ashidda'u ala al-kuffar Ruhama'u baynahum They are unflinching, tough, severe when it comes to the kuffar to the disbelievers, the enemies of Islam and when it comes to each other, what does he say? They are merciful In another place he says Adhillatin ala al-mu'meen They are powerless when they present themselves before believers they step on their own ego to present themselves before their believers. They're humble before them. But we have egos. We look at each other with ego-filled eyes. That's how we look at each other. We give each other dirty looks. There's no humility in our, even the, the way we look at each other. But there's supposed to be humility. And when you have that, shaitan is being defeated. Shaitan is being defeated. One last thing inshallah ta'ala that I wanted to share with you about this organizational structure and another issue that we have within communities. There's the issue of permission. There's the issue of permission. Of course, when we work for something voluntarily, then, you know, family comes up, work comes up, something personal came up, you don't want to talk about it. You weren't able to do what you were told to do. If you miss a meeting, are you supposed to call the leader, whoever it is, let them know? Yeah, you're supposed to let them know. And when you don't let them know, you know what it shows? It shows that you think this work is worthless. There are no consequences for not taking this seriously. You would never do that with your job. You know why? Because there are consequences when you don't take it seriously. But you figure this is Allah's work. It's voluntary. There's no, you know, there's no oversight. But you see, the only time we will get the volunteer work right is when we understand that the oversight is from who? It's from Allah. When you lose sight of that, then this is just voluntary and it's no big deal. It only remains a big deal so long as we remain in touch with the word of Allah. One of the very important things in our meetings is powerful reminder. We need a reminder of why we are there. We need a reminder of why we're volunteering. Why we're working in this organization? Why we're helping out? Why, were we, why are we spending time you know, at the school or at the masjid or at the MSA or whatever else? Why are we doing it? We need that reminder. We need it. Because when we don't get that reminder constantly, our intentions, our motives, our psyche, it changes. It starts deforming. So we need to be refreshed constantly. Now the thing I wanted to share with you is really beautiful. How much time do I have left by the way? Five minutes? Okay. There's this almost riddle in the Qur'an. In Surah At-Tawbah, Allah Azza wa Jal says, إِنَّمَا يَسْتَأْذِنُكْ أَلَّذِينَ لَا يُؤْمِنُونَ بِاللَّهِ وَالْيَوْمِ الْآخِرِ Those who ask your permission, don't believe in Allah and the last day. Listen again. Those who are asking your permission, don't believe in Allah and the last day. Now again, we find Surah An-Nur. Allah Azza wa Jal says, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ يَسْتَأْذِنُونَكْ أُولَٰئِكَ الَّذِينَ يُؤْمِنُونَ بِاللَّهِ وَالْيَوْمِ الْآخِرِ Those who ask your permission, they're the ones who believe in Allah in the last day. In Surah At-Tawbah he said, those who are asking your permission, believe or don't believe? Don't believe. In Surah At-Nur he said, those who ask your permission, are the ones who believe. A riddle. You see, understand, from a leader's point of view, and this is the last thing I'll talk about, from a leader's point of view, if you're a good leader, then you understand people. You know how to measure people. If you're a good leader, you will never give your follower an assignment that you know they're not going to do. You will only give them what you know they will do. You know why? Because they're volunteers. And if they're volunteers, if you give them like, you don't even need the assignment. You just, hey, by the way, uh, brother, just write the letter A on this piece of paper. Sure. That's letter A. Great job! You let them know that they did a good job. You know what this does? It builds encouragement. So that in the future, this volunteer will be doing more. But if you overpower a volunteer, and you give them more than you know they can handle, they can't handle that much. You haven't tested them yet. Right? <coughs> what happens to their enthusiasm? It disappears. Similarly, there are workers and there are slackers in every organization. This is a fact. There are workers in Islamic organizations and also there are 
slackers. A good leader, person speaking, will not call anyone a worker or a slacker, but he will know the worker from the slacker. Now the slacker comes at the, in the time of emergency. So the Tawbah is a time of emergency. The slacker comes and says, I can't go to Tabuk. Too many beautiful women on the path, I'll become fall, I'll fall into fitna, therefore I can't go for jihad fi sabiillah. He gives an excuse. The messenger says, go. You're excused. Allah lets him know those who asked your permission did not believe. The people who, who shy away in the, at the time of emergency, they were not really with you. They were not really with you. But under normal circumstances, under normal circumstances, not emergency situations, which is Surah an nur normal circumstance. Under normal circumstances, the only people who ask permission are people who care. If, you don't, if you're a slacker, you'll skip the work and you won't even make any calls. You won't care. But if you care about the work, at least you will do what? Ask permission. So the two comparisons are one of a normal situation where we should ask permission. And an emergency situation where you shouldn't be asking permission, you should be doing the work because it's an emergency. Everything else should be put aside. If you come up with excuses at the time of emergency, then you're, you're a troublemaker. Then you don't really believe in this project. Finally, finally, inshaAllah ta'ala, for a leader, one of the great wisdoms in not asking too much from the hard worker, and, and uh, please understand this, this is very important, okay? If you work at a store, you do all the hard work, and you have a co-worker, he doesn't do anything. He's a useless guy. New Year's came. It's extra sales season, right? You have to do less work or more work at that time? You have to do more work. The boss comes, the, 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 the slacker, he goes to the boss, he says, boss, can I have uh, four days off? Boss says, go, enjoy. You go and you say, man, I want to spend time with my family too. You go and say, can I have four days off? What does the boss say? No, you got to stay. Now you're thinking, man, the boss didn't give me, I do all this work and he didn't give me day off. And this slacker does nothing and on top of that he gets to enjoy what? A vacation. But from the boss's point of view, this is entirely different. What's the boss, think, boss thinking? The boss is thinking, this guy who I let go is probably better anyway. Because he would have been more trouble than it's worth. But this guy who I'm not letting go is too valuable to me. So I have to, I know it's mean, but I need him. I need him. So oftentimes what will happen to you is, people will start asking more and more and more of you. And you'll start getting exhausted. But you know what that's an indication of? You've become more and more and more valuable. You're no longer a slacker. But my bit of advice to you, because it's a volunteer organization, especially for young people here, don't burn yourself out. Don't volunteer for 20 things. Volunteer for one thing. Volunteer for two things. There's no shortage of good things to do. But when you start becoming part of too many good things, you become a slacker in all of them. In other words, instead of helping these causes, what ends up happening is, you start hurting all these causes. Do little, but do it well. Do a little, but do it well. Be consistent with it. Be good at it. But don't have your hands in everything. I want to be the president of the MSA and the emir of this group and the secretary of this masjid committee and the in charge of that youth program and this and that and the other. No, 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 no. Slow it down. The world doesn't need you. Islam will go on. You do that little that you have to do and do it well. And that's, you, know, you continue in that path inshallah. These are just a few tips that I wanted to share. Just observations that inshallah ta'ala can help benefit Muslim communities when it comes to just dealing with each other, number one. Also in, in keeping our intentions, our motives, our incentives refined. We have a few minutes for questions inshallah ta'ala. If you have any, I'd love to take them. If I'm qualified to answer, I'll answer. You had your hand up first. Oh, I wish I remembered. Hafiz Sahib, where's إِذَا قِيلَ لَكُمْ تَفَسَّحُوا فِي الْمَجَالِسِ فَفَسَّحُوا Mujadala, right? Yeah, Mujadala. 58, I believe. 58. Yeah. Oh, the ayat themselves? Okay, uh, for leadership, the most important ayat to read is Ali Imran 159. Ali Imran 159. That's the leniency of the leader. We talked about that, right? Um... Surah Mujadala, ayah number 11, 
the ayat about permission occur in Surah At-Tawbah. I don't know which ayat numbers, but I think it's in the 40s. <coughs> and also in Surah Nur, number 24. And uh, for cohesion in the Muslim community, which surah did I tell you to go through? Hujurat, 49. 49. All of it is priceless, priceless uh, advice from Allah on community. Yeah. Yes, I can. Sure, sure. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Okay, good question. I'll take all of them at the same time, actually. Yeah. So, good example, ethnicity. You had a question? There's too many. Uh, I'll, we'll talk about that. Last one, yeah. Mm hmm. Some, some, some. Mm hmm. I knew that was coming. Well, I'll come to you after I'm done with these. I'll come to you in a second, inshallah. Let me answer these for you, inshallah. <coughs> Good examples of communities. I'm very impressed with Raleigh, North Carolina. I like what they do. They're very transparent in their communications. There's a great deal of brotherhood. It's a multi-ethnic community under, uh, mashallah, very good uh, imam and a great bunch of volunteers that are constantly, you know, they know each other not just at the masjid, but they go to each other's homes and there's this brotherhood. Families know each other and this is important. Most of the time people that know each other at the masjid only know each other at the masjid, right? Uh, so the masjid almost turns into a battlefield sometimes. Uh, so, but if you, if you go to each other's homes, the ice breaks. So even if you get into a fight, it's like siblings. You work it out, you know? So, that, uh, so that's one great example. Uh, another good community, I mean, by the way, every community has problems because the jama'ah of the messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam also had problems. So if you're looking for a community without problems, let me know when you get there. So, but inshallah ta'ala we'll hang out in Jannah, inshallah ta'ala, you know, by Allah's mercy, all of us, without problems. So, um, another community that I found impressive was the MCA in Santa Clara, California. Um, Irving in Dallas, really nice community, alhamdulillah. I'm hoping to move there one day, inshallah, uh, eventually. Um, so there are, there are a handful of really nice examples. Uh, I can give you a ton of terrible examples, but I won't. Uh, inshallah. Uh, your question was about ethnicities. Um, most of the problem occurs when the masjid or the organization, most of the time is the masjid, is dominated by a, a specific ethnicity. And the people that suffer from that are, the, of course, the people that aren't in the majority, but most of all, new Muslims. The real uh, you know, the, the real casualty of ethnically concentrated masajid are new Muslims. Because, you know, I'll tell you a true story. One of my really close friends became Muslim on his own. He did research online. He was a, he was a philosophy master's degree. You know, your typical run-of-the-mill yuppie white guy with his wife who's doing PhD in biomedicine. They're both really intellectual types. They just start looking into religion after their child is born, their first son is born. Uh, with the umbilical cord tied around their neck seven, his neck seven times. And he said, there is a God, there, there has to be. He starts looking into religion, opens up his old notes on world religions, and reads his own comments that say, this Tawheed thing is awesome. <laughs> so he starts looking into Islam, becomes Muslim, learns to pray off of YouTube, and like online, and then his wife learns how to pray, and then they go to the masjid for the first time. So they go to the masjid, his wife goes into the sister's section. This, uh, this lady sees her. She's wearing hijab and jibab, everything. She learned how to do this on her own. So she starts talking to her in Arabic. And she says, I'm sorry, I don't speak Arabic. 
So the woman says to her, What will not call it Muslim? Are you don't speak Arabic? This is the language of Islam. Astaghfirullah al-Azim. Right? And this lady, since it's been like four years, she hasn't gone back to the masjid. She's a Muslima, but she can't stand the masjid. Because, and why did this happen? Because ethnic concentration. We don't really understand our religion. We're very ethnic sometimes. And it comes out. And actually, this brother, subhanAllah, he's the principal of the Islamic school now in his community. But the kinds of things he gets to hear, it's almost like the people that are born Muslims or they come from Muslim countries, they feel like they own Islam and they're renting it out to these people. Seriously. And they talk to them like, oh, brother, yeah, you're new, I understand. <laughs> this guy knows more than you, man. <laughs> You've got like 50 years of sins compiled, he's fresh, he's clean. You should, you should be like getting his autograph, you're talking to him like that. But you know, but that's his... So, so there's this, um, there's this uh, unfortunately, this, this, this complex that, that is very prevalent in, uh, in some communities. Uh, one of the ways to tackle that, actually, is through leadership. Especially the Imam. You know, a lot of times, and I'll be raw about this, I'm, I'm sorry I'm going to be crude, but I'll, you know one of the biggest fights I've seen all over the country is a, is a sizable Arab population, a sizable Desi population, and there's a fight about Arab Imam or Desi Imam, Arab Imam or Desi Imam, Arab Imam or Desi Imam. And I speak a little bit of Arabic, so when I went to one community, the Arabs invited me for dinner, and the whole dinner, guess what they're telling me? We should have an Arab Imam. And the next day, the Desi is inviting me for some biryani, and guess what they're telling me? We should have a desi imam. The day after that, I invited both of them. And I said, let me ask you this. Let me ask you this. Whether we get an Arab imam or a desi imam, your kids, are they listening to their lectures? They're all in the parking lot. You want to remember back in the day, Cairo or Hyderabad or Lahore, so this imam is going to make you feel like, you know, back, back in the old time, make you feel good, like you stepped into this masjid outside of the United States to this time travel and continental travel portal and now you're sitting in the middle of the, you know, back in the day and you're cracking jokes in, in Urdu or in Arabic or whatever like good old times while your kids who are very American and not really Egyptian at all or, or Pakistani or Indian or Bangladeshi or Indonesian, they're just American they don't eat baklava, they eat pizza, right? They, that's what they eat. They don't understand the Imam at all, they're outside hanging out, right? So this debate has happened, you know why? The, the way to fix it is to revive the priority. If the priority is our children, that is a shared concern. When the priority is your school of thought, your ethnicity, your ideology, a, a certain baggage that you bring from home, then there's always going to be conflict. But there's one shared state of emergency all Muslims share in this country. Whether you come from Senegal, or you come from Ethiopia, or you come from Turkey, or you come from Pakistan, or you come from Europe, wherever you come from, guess what your biggest problem is? Your kids. When you realize that, there will be unity in the community. Then the decisions will be formed because the priority is our children and our women's education. That's the priority. And the communities that I'm telling you that have succeeded, the only thing that made them succeed, they realize this is their priority. They're not centered around anything but the idea of serving family. And that's what the masjid needs to center around. We're living really in a state of emergency. And, and this is one of the biggest problems uh, we're facing. The third thing was motivation. Where do you find uh, uh, sources of motivation? I think there's not enough dars quran There's not enough reminder from the Qur'an. The Sahaba were a culture of Qur'an. And the Qur'an is miraculously, you know, it, it divinely motivational. If it's just understood that way. If people are just reminded through the book of Allah that way. You know, the, the, the most powerful khutbah you will hear will be a khutbah that's centered around what? The Qur'an, the ayat of Qur'an. And this is a sunnah of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The, the khutbah, the most part, it was Qur'an. For the most part. And the ibadah, which is supposed to motivate us, the ibadah, what's the biggest ibadah? Salah. What's the biggest part of salah? Qiyam. What's Qiyam? Qur'an. It's supposed to motivate us. It's supposed to give us khushu. So there's this, it's not certain passages or anything. It's just Qur'an in general. It should be a part of the motivational culture of our community. It should be like that. We should be getting reminders from the Qur'an every day. Powerful reminders every day. And th this is a, a critical need. I forgot what the last one was. What's a new one? Then she had it first and then you. Someone was here that had Yeah. Okay, what are the ethics of constructive criticism? Never criticize, never, ever, ever criticize to someone in your own rank. 
Meaning, if you're all board members and there's a president, and you have a criticism about the president, who do you criticize to? The president. Don't criticize to everybody else. And always criticize in private first. And then when it's not resolved, then you criticize in public with him present, with the person present. And it's better to do so in writing because then emotions aren't involved. When you do it you know, in writing, it's better. And, and always phrase your criticisms with dua for the person you're criticizing first. May Allah reward you. Your contributions are amazing. This is happening, this is happening. This is ha I was wondering if we could address this one concern. Word it in a way that isn't offensive. Don't start like, brother, why are you doing this? Don't start it like that. You're just asking for a fight. You know, there's this Sheikh, the, the Sheikh Shankiti from Atlanta. Every time he sends me an email, even if it's, he's sending me an email to let me know the flight is at that time or whatever, there's like two paragraphs of dua for me and my family, and then he tells me the flight's at 8 p.m. This is adab. This is adab. There's this love the man has for members of this ummah. Right? This, this is what we have to share. So when we criticize someone, first, you just, you break the ice, you let them know before you criticize, far more than your criticism is your appreciation of them and your love and affection for them because they share with you, La ilaha illallah. Because of that. And then you criticize in the most, the softest of ways because the, the Qur'an says, Adillatin ala al-mu'minin. Right? What we remember from the Qur'an is, Amr bil ma'roof, nahi ala al-munkar. Right? Enjoining the good, forbidding the evil, brother. By the way, enjoining the good and forbidding the evil was mentioned for the kuffar. And there are some things mentioned for believers, the ethics, even if you want to join the, enjoin the good and forbid the evil, there's a way to do so with Muslims. Not by yelling at them, not by humiliating them, not by embarrassing them. That's not the way. Uh, Akhi, there was a brother before you who had a hand up and I uh, ignored him and then I'll come to you. Wa <laughs> Yes. Person is what? Oh, okay. This should be the last question? Okay, so if, um, if I don't get to the rest of your questions, you can just come up, I'll stay behind. But I'll, I'll get to that, inshallah ta'ala. You say that a per, uh, actions are the reflections of what is inside. Uh, not necessarily. You see, actions, bad actions, let's just say bad actions, either stem from evil intention or ignorance. Right? Evil intention or innocent ignorance. Which one do we have to assume when a Muslim does a bad action? Ignorance. Ignorance. So, you see, we have to give benefit of the doubt. We have to, have to, have to give benefit of the doubt. And if we don't do so, it creates chaos in society. If imagine, if we had the license to call someone a munafiq, you know what would happen? The quarter of the world's population, the Muslims, every one of them will be calling every other one of them munafiq. I am munafiq by somebody else's standards, and they are munafiq by somebody else's standards, and you are munafiq by somebody else's standards. Everybody has these different standards for judging this one thing, and everybody starts labeling away. Allah didn't give us this license because it would create utter chaos. It would create major, major problems. And the Muslims that don't understand this are the Muslims who say, our Imam is a munafiq, we're going to repeat our prayer. And this happens. This happens. And this is a disease. This is a very, very serious disease. Allah did not give us the right to judge people, especially Muslims. We can say that they're utterly wrong when they say hijab is not fard. And Muslims say that. Some Muslims say hijab is not fard. We can say we vehemently disagree, but we, we know that their disagreement, inshallah ta'ala, is based on ignorance, and when they're presented the facts properly, in a, in a way that is conducive to learning, not in an intimidating way, you munafiq, let me tell you about the ayah of hijab, that's not gonna work. You gotta be nice. You gotta be soft. Nobody listens to anybody when they're mean. You don't do that at work. You don't do that at school. You don't do that at the line and at the airport. So you have to be nice to people when you talk to them. So even when the Muslim says the most horrendous thing, you don't even expect, why would a Muslim say something like that? Even when they do that, your response has to be calm, collected, patient. And when you deal with people with patience, you will see that if there's any good in them, and the best good is already there, La ilaha illallah is already there. That's the ultimate good. It will come out. You just have to give it a chance to come out. If you come out antagonistic, and the flag of Islam waving, and the sword waving in the other hand, then it's not then all you can expect is more antagonism between parties. 
I'm sorry, Muslim, are you know? He said, he's in charge, he said, time's up. So I'll stick around, you can come up and ask questions, inshallah ta'ala. Subhanak Allahumma wa bihamdik, nashadu an la ilaha illa anta, nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk, wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.